Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my Am Reading Mid-Month March 2024 check-in video. <laughs> it's about the best I can do here. Things are weird. <laughs> I'm also weirded out. I'm not sure what to expect from the light looking in the viewfinder and thinking of the time I'm filming. You know, it might be one of those situations where I ultimately bathe myself in a uh, shadow. You know, things are a little different as the seasons change and daylight saving and blah blah, but uh, I guess we'll see how it goes. Uh, I definitely want to get this video out, although, uh, you know, it's kind of been a rough start to the month. There's been some things that uh, happened uh, this month that, I mean, aren't necessarily unforeseen or shouldn't have been. Like, uh, the big one is I'm taking part in my synagogue's Purim spiel, so I guess that's one of the major things that, uh, I don't know, that, you know, it's taking up uh, rehearsal time that usually I wouldn't have as rehearsal time, uh, reading time, you know, uh, having less time for reading, so it seems. Uh, and uh, I've completed less than I would have hoped by this point in the month, and I might have to uh, admit to myself that uh, I won't get to 10 books this month and, you know, start uh, prioritizing what needs to be prioritized. Uh, but uh, I guess we'll see what happens in later videos with that. Uh, for now, uh, I have a couple of things to share. Uh, but before I get into that, since this is technically my first AM reading video of the month, I'll share my February literary newsletter down below. Uh, it's my a uh, monthly tradition uh, of um, compiling literary news that caught my interest. Um, and uh, I have a book pick and a book quote uh, and snippets of all the Goodreads reviews of the books I uh, attributed to February. So uh, check it out. And now I can get into March reading. <laughs> As always with these videos, I'm going to start with a uh, short story I'm reading from a collection, and uh, this week I am reading the final uh, story in American short fiction, the uh, Summer 2023 edition, and I have a new literary newsletter, uh, you know, lined up for next week, but uh, before I get there, I'm going to talk about Orbits by Jeffrey Renard Allen. This is a very long short story, about 30-ish uh, pages, uh, and uh, it's a futuristic uh, short story uh, with uh, some elements of, uh, of alternate history. Um, one thing, I, I'm not familiar enough with Muhammad Ali's uh, career on my own, so I actually did a little bit of research uh, to confirm uh, because this uh, short story uh, by Alan is uh, published in a collection that was also published this year that I'll link down below. So I got to uh, understand uh, that uh, Muhammad Ali does feature in this story, uh, but it's predominantly following this young woman named Layla. Uh, and when I say it's uh, futuristic, it's very much allegorical, uh, like her father, uh, is uh, spacefaring to the moon as part of the nation, uh, by which it seems very apparent we mean the nation of Islam, and there's a lot of black power references and white devil references, and he's going to the moon for the people. You know, it's for sort of uh, murky purposes, but it's obviously meant to be uh, ideological for the black power movement. And, you know, there's just a lot of talk about the nation and references to Allah, so it really does seem Nate, like the nation of Islam is uh, the major thing uh, that's in commentary here. And so Layla is at home at this uh, mansion that uh, her father and her live at. There's moon people around that, uh, you know, communicate with telekinesis and I guess are part of the mission that her father is on. Her uncle has come to stay with her. Her uncle works as a doctor in a metaphorical way that he uh, cuts off the tails of white devils and occasionally uh, gives them to black people, which seems like commentary on power and privilege. Uh, and But ultimately, I think uh, the most interesting thing about this is how she feels uh, sort of suppressed, I think, by her father and uncle. And uh, Muhammad Ali, who is known here as the champ, is her neighbor and offers her some safe harbor, I think, like for secretly plotting and celebrating her 16th birthday party. But otherwise, things are very metaphorical about what's going on. She goes to school with white devils and it 
becomes apparent even though you know it's not said in you know direct language like her teacher is Mr. Levine and we start by I don't know talking about Greek myths and then we move into what seems like uh, oppression Olympics of a sort between blacks and Jews at least you know given what they're talking about with Holocaust and slavery and all of that uh, and I guess you know I found some of these metaphors to be interesting for a little bit although it kind of stretched on for three for 30 pages <laughs> But, you know, this isn't usually my style. You know, I'd rather talk much more realistically and complexly about issues of race rather than using this big allegory about, uh, I don't know, white devils being literal and space travel being something where you find aliens on the moon that are connected to, you know, our ideological movements here on Earth. Uh, I would rather space travel be in science fiction. I'm, you know, a purist sometimes, I, I think, when it comes to literature. Uh, the thing that compelled me the most about the story is uh, Layla's, uh, I guess, relationship or how she felt, you know, suppressed by her father and uncle and that the champ was giving her um, a little bit of freedom. But uh, ultimately, uh, you know, it kind of compelled me a little on an intellectual level, but I wasn't very moved uh, on an emotional level about the characters in the story. The first full-length book I have to talk about is a novel. Uh, this is In Memoriam by Alice Wynn, which I uh, added uh, quite late to my uh, anticipated reads of 2023. I mean, technically, it, I added it but after it came out. I heard about this book first through the Goodreads Choice Awards, and it sounded intriguing to me, and then I saw it more and more like on best of lists and that sort of thing. I was hoping it might make the booktube prize a long list, but uh, actually I don't think uh, Robert even included it uh, on uh, the possibilities list. You know, there's so many books, so I guess I can't really fault him, but I still wanted to get to it myself, and it came in through the library. And here we go! <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, this is historical fiction. Um, that takes place during World War II, predominantly tracking these two uh, English uh, schoolboys. Uh, they go to this like elite prep school. Their interests are highly uh, literary, like, uh, you know, one of them is really into the classics, one is into poetry, you know, their speech throughout is just really high class and they're very sheltered in a way, uh, but uh, they are both um, gay. Uh, and they both, you know, have unrequited, you know, crushes on each other. They're best friends and, you know, there's constant physicality between them, but they're too scared to sort of admit to their feelings. They both get involved with other boys uh, a little bit, uh, but, um, you know, ultimately uh, it takes until the war for them to sort of uh, admit to each other and act on their own feelings. Uh, so the first uh, young man, Gaunt, is, uh, enlists first because he has German ancestry and his mother and sister and father are sort of starting to get, you know, ostracized by their, um, you know, English uh, neighbors about, you know, who they are. Uh, so they figure, you know, having a son in the infantry would help, you know, uh, show their patriotism. And, you know, it's something he doesn't want to do, like, in large part at first, because he wants to finish his studies, like at the prep school, and then move on to university. And then ultimately, because, you know, it becomes apparent pretty early on that there's a pretty significant chasm between, you know, the uh, poetic romanticism of war versus the reality of modern warfare in World War I. Uh, so we go back and forth for a little between, uh, for letters between uh, uh, Gaunt and Elwood, the other uh, young man. Uh, and, uh, you know, we see that Gaunt is losing friends, including, you know, people he knew at school and is in battles himself and is grievously or, or significantly wounded in one of them. And Elwood decides he just, you know, uh, well, I mean, I think it's in part because, you know, Gaunt thinks, you know, this really could kill me. And I, you know, and he's starting to actually unload his feelings for the first time ever because he realizes this could be the end for him. And Elwood wants to be there with him at the end. And, you know, there's, I guess, also continuing pressure about enlistment and all that, and so Elwood decides to enlist himself, and he and Gaunt end up serving together, and it's just a, a poignant, harrowing mix of the two of them finding love together and experiencing these horrors of war where, you know, uh, people were in the infantry were dying left and right and getting grievously wounded, you know, just 
popping out of uh, the trench holes. Uh, and, um, you know, um, there's just uh, so much um, machine gunfire and grenades. And uh, it's just, you know, it, it was just a horror in so many ways. And so many people died. Uh, and there's, so, there's commentary, too, about, you know, the Germans and the English. And when it comes to the man-on-man -man infantry stuff, how similar they both are and how pointless this fighting can be. Uh, you know, just uh, taking the lives of all of these people and then, you know, the shell shock comes in for everything these people have to endure. And there's commentary, too, about you know, the toxic masculinity of it all, of people just not understanding or having empathy for uh, the shell shock and some, uh, you know, uh, concerning uh, violence even in the school systems, like, you know, that uh, even, like, you know, the... Uh, uh, hazing rituals like at uh, this uh, fictional prep school there's a lot of violence to them as well that's you know condoned uh, and there's you know classism issues like uh, they're these uh, young boys or young men or you know upper class uh, kids who can like buy their way into higher positions and sometimes are you know uh, reigning it over uh, uh, lower class older men who uh, cannot and don't have uh, the uh, privileges that the uh, that Elwood and Gaunt do in terms of uh, their um, uh, financial uh, prestige. Uh, but at the same time, someone like, uh, you know, Gaunt is dealing with his German heritage, and Elwood is dealing with uh, his uh, Jewish ancestry. His family isn't practicing anymore, uh, but, uh, uh, or at least not uh, fully. It seems like he might have one or two memories of something, but... Uh, you know, it's it's not something he practices, but there's still like a genteel anti-Semitism of you don't really belong here, you're upstarts and wanderers, and you don't have that, you know, esteemed English heritage. Uh, and it became apparent uh, before I even confirmed it by checking that uh, uh, Wynn based uh, uh, Elwood off of uh, Siegfried Sassoon, who was a... Uh, a Jewish ancestry uh, World War II poet, uh, you know, veteran. Uh, and so there were, you know, hints in here that reminded me it was pretty cool that I read a biography of the Sassoon family last summer and could, you know, piece it together on my own. Uh, and, you know, the Jewish issues stood out to me personally as well, especially like taking a broader look at the war and where it fits into 20th century history, uh, like about how it's the start of the end of Imperium uh, and how, uh, you know, things continue into World War II and like empires are slowly dying off and, uh, uh, you know, nationalism rises in its place. And, you know, those are just sort of my own sort of uh, armchair philosophy thoughts about the meanings of these wars. And meanwhile, we're in the middle of this one, which is just so harrowing and it's supposed to be gallant and it's supposed to end all wars and it's just not doing any of these things. and. She just has a deft way of dealing with, you know, the trauma of it all. And on top of that, uh, these uh, young men trying to forge a relationship in a society that's homophobic. And, you know, I, I wrote a review of this. I really loved this book. I don't think I talked a lot about the specific characters of Elwood and Gaunt, how Gaunt was sort of this uh, young boy who had to... Um, protect his uh, emotions by being buff and becoming a fighter. And he had a lot of trouble in the beginning, like uh, sitting with his emotions at, at all. Uh, and uh, the war changed him a bit based on his experiences that it physically weakened him. And maybe that was able to, you know, open up his emotions a little more. And Elwood in a way was slightly opposite in that he was the one who was in love with poetry and constantly quoted poetry and maybe was like over the top with emotional expression, but the things he suffered during the war made him much more caustic. And you know, they're both suffering from trauma and like it's suffering as human beings. And like, there's a question of, can you come back from that? And you know, I guess I personally, you know, the things about war stories that stick out to me is just, uh, you know, that desperation or trying to maintain human relationships you know and it's just uh the, like the the big thing for me is you know can these two men be human together after this uh and uh i think that's where the story sort of ends about you know questioning you know after all they've gone through is that possible uh and so i just i found it really beautiful and moving harrowing you know 
not enjoyable <laughs> in the traditional sense of the word, but uh, I, I thought it was, you know, it was a really fascinating mix of these big issues about World War I and then the following the intricate small issues of these two men in love with each other. And the final book I have to talk about is Judgment at Tokyo, World War II on Trial and the Making of Modern Asia by Gary J. Bass. So this might have influenced my other book a little bit as well because I've been deep in the uh, trenches, no pun intended, of World War I and World War II and comparing and contrasting them uh, because this is a, a bit of a chunkster. In fact, I've actually been listening to it on audio rather than, you know, lug this around to work. <laughs> and this is nonfiction that it covers the Tokyo trial, which uh, happened after World War II ended, where the Allies came together basically to judge and punish uh, Japanese war criminals. And then this particular story gets broader about... Uh, not only what the Japanese did, but uh, what was done to them, uh, you know, trying to get a broader understanding of uh, war crimes and why the war was fought and, you know, how they understood it and how we can take a step back through history to understand what happened. And uh, that's all I'm going to say for now, because I am uh, reading this book for the BookTube Prize. So the Book 2 Prize was started by Robert Sheard back in 2019 as a way for the literary book community to judge the best in U.S. published literary fiction and nonfiction uh, that was published the year before. So for 2024, we're looking at 2023 releases. We are currently in the first of four rounds uh, judging uh, several ballots for the octafinals, and I am judging nonfiction Group B. So I will be pitting this book against uh, five others, and I have to submit my rankings by the end of the month, so time is indeed ticking away. Uh, and then uh, we'll aggregate our top three of my judge pool uh, to send on to the quarterfinals. Uh, so yeah, uh, but in the meantime, I'm not supposed to talk about my thoughts of the books. We're supposed to, you know, not influence each other's personal, you know, opinions on the books. But uh, until I can give my thoughts after the round ends, I do have some preliminary thoughts I gave before I started reading, and I have more information to the BookTube Prize, both linked down below. So that about covers it for me now. Actually, it doesn't seem too bad. I don't think I'm, you know, bathed in shadow like uh, I might have been uh, in months past. Uh, so this worked out pretty well. Hopefully it's a short and sweet video in its way that I can get up quickly and move on to the next thing. <laughs> I've been enjoying my reading. I have, uh, but there's so much to do coming up. Uh, but anyway, I hope to be back on this channel in the next few days to do a Would You Read It Challenge video uh, where I'm actually taking a look at Book 2 Prize ballots from yesteryear and reading the beginnings of all of the books in fiction and uh, discussing uh, what I think of them. It's a fun way to talk about the Book 2 Prize uh, where I actually can talk about the Book 2 Prize because uh, these books are no longer in the running. So anyway, stay tuned for that. And I hope you're all having uh, a wonderful uh, reading experience in March and that your weather is good. It's uh, been a little up and down here in the DC area with uh, the temperature, but uh, right now the cherry blossoms are in peak bloom and that's another thing I'd love to go and uh, eke out the time to, to see them uh, before it's too late. <laughs> uh, and spring is uh, on its way, which is uh, nice in and of itself. Uh, so I hope uh, you're all doing well. And uh, thanks so much for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time.